Acts 9, starting from verse 1, let's read this. It says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you, Lord, for what you show us here. Oh, Lord, we desire to hear from you. We want to know how it is that you do convict the hearts. We know that you that's your job. You did that with Saul of Tarsus here, and you changed him to become Paul the Apostle. And we knew you you, we know you do that same transformational work within each and every one of our lives and upon our hearts. So as you reveal this to us today, God, we ask that you please would open up your scriptures. Please use your word to speak to our hearts. Please help us to hear from you, Lord. Please help us to discern how you might convict our hearts, even right here and now, Lord. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. Oh, Lord, encourage us. And again, God, as you are the God of all comfort, please comfort each and every one of our hearts here, God. Encourage us, for we ask, we cry out to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You guys can have a seat if you would, please. So today I want to teach you about how God convicts the heart. And in our story today, we're going to see a guy that we call Saul of Tarsus. I'm going to show you a map here. He was from a region called Tarsus, as you see, way up above there on the right side near the top. And what he's doing here as we open up Acts chapter 9 is we know that he's got access to the high priest. He actually gets written permission from the high priest to go all the way from Jerusalem way down here on the map up to Damascus. And I mapped it out. It's roughly, approximately 202 miles. So today, of course, we jump on a jet and we get there quick. Or we drive in a car. How would you travel back then? Walking, right? Running, some people. <laughs> Maybe ride a horse, a donkey. Carriage, right? <laughs> if you're rich, a chariot, <laughs> like in the previous passage. So in our story today, we see a guy named Saul of Tarsus, and dare I say that God is trying to give you and I a peek into not just Saul of Tarsus and not just his backstory before he became Paul the Apostle. I think one of the things that God is trying to show you and me are principles of how God convicts the heart. And every single one of us wants to know, right? God, I want to hear your voice. I want to be able to discern and learn how you might speak to me, how I might hear your still small voice. Right, remember that passage? That's back in 1 Kings chapter 19 in the Old Testament. Elijah was running away. How many voices was he running away from? One. Sometimes it's, it could be that one girl in your life. Right? He was used by God to destroy all the false prophets, mocking their false God, because he knows there's only one God, and their God didn't exist. Maybe he's on the toilet. Maybe he's on vacation. And they were cutting themselves, screaming, crying out to a false God. And he knew it didn't exist. And then he asked God, he prayed and asked God to send down fire to consume the sacrifice. I'm paraphrasing the story. You could read it later on. And God consumed the sacrifice, looked up all the water. Everybody's probably gasping, going, Whoa, your God, He is Lord. He is God. God told him, Okay, go capture all the people, the false prophets. And He ex executed all of them. And then, turn the page, next passage, you see this one person. What was her name? Jezebel. Jezebel. <laughs> Sometimes all it takes is one negative voice in your life, right? Use mildly by God, and this is a challenge too. After you use by God, be careful because your heart can also be very sensitive at that time. 
one voice. Surely by tomorrow you're going to be dead like them. And so what does Elijah do? He's bold and fearless, right? No. He runs because of one voice. Jezebel. So he runs. He's running from God even. <laughs> what are you doing here, Elijah? Is what God asks him. He's hiding. Oh, Lord, I'm running for my life. He, he's too scared to admit like all of us, like how I am too sometimes. Too scared to admit, God, I'm just a, I'm afraid. I'm in fear. I'm scared. She's kind of scary, God. <laughs> he just saw God send fire down from heaven. So that can happen in our lives. And that's the passage in 1 Kings chapter 19 where God speaks to him as we call a still, small voice. So God speaks to us in a similar way upon our hearts like he did with Elijah in 1 Kings 19. And it's a still voice. It's not a erratic, loud, proud voice like we expect to hear. Like a Harley running down the street, waking you up at night. Because, you know, that's what they do here. We expect that God will do that. He may, but oftentimes it's a still voice, and we have to calm ourselves to be able to hear. And it's a small voice. Not all the time, but many times. So we need to learn how to discern how to hear from God. All of us are. And we're going to make mistakes, myself as well. A lot of it's trial and error. But my guess, as we prayed, my guess is that's why you all are here. My guess is that's what you want to learn too. I want to learn how to hear from you, Lord. And I want to know how it is that, again, how you can convict the heart. So as we learn the backstory of this guy, Paul the Apostle, and now we see him as Saul of Tarsus, we're going to see, as we peek into the first five verses here, and we're going to hopefully go a little slow through this, because this is your life story too. Maybe not so much like Saul of Tarsus, but where you're going to learn, just like Saul, how to hear from God and how to know how he convicts the hearts. So what Saul didn't know are three simple but strong principles that you're going to learn. I'm going to share that with you, God willing, today before we end. But back to our story here. And in verse 1, check this out. I'm going to display this here on the screen so you can see this. Verse 1 says, Then Saul, still breathing threats, and murder against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest. That's Acts 9, verse 1. Here on the display in the purple, color-coded it for you. This word for breathing, it's this word empneo. Empneo. Big deal. What does that mean, Drew? <laughs> Good question. Now, first of all, this is the only place in all the Bible where this word occurs. Only in this verse. And when you look it up in the Bible dictionaries, one of them's named Thayer's. Here's what one of the definitions says about this word breathing. Threatenings and slaughter were so to speak the element from which he drew his breath. Now this is huge because as God's opening up the backstory to Paul the Apostle, he's letting you know that he was the main killer of Christians. Question for you. Have you ever seen, or maybe it's you, I know this has been me at times, praise God, not so much lately. But have you ever seen when someone's so angry that it turns into a different emotion? We call that rage. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen that? In California, we used to call it like road rage, right? <laughs> Where if someone's out of control. Paul's, or God's telling us that Saul was out of control. It was as if his anger had gotten to the point of where now you call this some would say unbridled rage. And what was now his mission in life? To threaten and murder Christians. You're like, what? This is the dude that wrote half of the New Testament? Yes. That was his backstory. All wrapped up in this one little word in this verse. And we'll get to some of it also in verse 5 as we go through his story. But this is extremely important as we're learning again. You see at the top how God convicts the heart. Because what Saul didn't know is what you're going to be able to see now. And we must know this. Must, must, must know this. So that you and I can be able to learn to discern how God convicts the heart. Where even Saul of Tarsus, God's putting his life on display. Praise God he doesn't put my journal or yours in the Bible, right? 
like you and I see each other after we've come to the cross. <laughs> we get to see how he was with his breathing as if it was animated. It was like the machinery where some of us work in hospitals. Like you see the, the machinery, the mechanisms that actually artificially, how would you say, animate that person's breathing. His breathing, his breathing in. You ever see someone enraged like that? He fed off of killing Christians. That's what this is telling us. Paul the Apostle? Whoa, that's crazy. That is. And so this is his story of how he met Jesus on the road. As we see here, Saul of Tarsus, he's out of control. Again, it's as if his breath was animated by these threats and murder against Christians. Saul lived for killing Christians. We've got to kind of let that settle into our hearts. So one of the things about storytelling, some of you guys know this, I know this because I study this, in storytelling, you learn someone's backstory. And as ugly as it is, it kind of makes a better story for the person, right? Because now you can have empathy for the person. Now you can have more compassion for the person. Hard to have compassion for Paul the Apostle when you see that this is backstory, right? But when you see what God did to radically transform him from way out there on one side to Paul the Apostle there, hey, I didn't do that bad. I'm maybe a little over here, and I'm a little up here in my conversion, in my transformation. But wow, if you could do that with a Saul of Tarsus, who his mission was to kill Christians, and then you turn him into Paul the Apostle. Now I can understand how when he writes his letters, how he calls himself the chief what? The chief sinner. And post-conversion, you and I have our memories, don't we? He remembered about the fact that he was killing Christians, and his breathing was animated by the fact of not just being angry, being enraged. He was in full-blown rage. He was totally out of control. And then now he's the one to teach the, the church the grace of God. You think, whoa, God's got a sense of humor, right? Isn't that crazy to think? So if God could do that with Saul of Tarsus and turn him into Paul the Apostle, can he do this with you? Yes, he can. He's done that with me in a mini, very, very tiny way next to Paul the Apostle. He could do this with us. So again, another way to think of this is with the word rage. He's breathing threats and murder. This wasn't just anger. He wasn't just mad. How dare you say Yeshua is Messiah? How dare you pull people out of synagogue and tell them to follow Yeshua and that he's alive? He wasn't just mad. He took pleasure out of killing Christians, dragging them off in chains for what? For torture and execution. You think your testimony's bad. This dude was one of the chief killers. That's why he comes and says in the New Testament, I'm a chief sinner. And only by the grace of God will God use me as an example to show what? God's grace. Because he knew his backstory. So God's telling you his backstory here. Now I'm going to show you something here as we read verses 3 through 5. Let's go ahead and read this here. And I'm going to display this. Verse 3. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Notice what he says here. This last sentence is key. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Ooh. So God's giving you and I insight into the inner workings of the heart. you got to know this. This is a key passage. Believe me, this is why, and I've been praying. I even asked my wife Susan, we were praying last night. I'm like, man, I don't want to just run through this and tell the story of Saul and then go through this because every single Christian wants to know how to hear from God. Every single one of us wants to know how is it that you convict our hearts, God? And it's a learning journey for each and every one of us, isn't it? 
will have trial and error. And for me, a lot of error, <laughs> but I still want to try. And I want to learn to discern his voice. Notice something here. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. I have a picture to illustrate it here. In the dictionary that I looked up, the first one actually that came up, you can just Google for this. You'll find the same dictionary I did. A dictionary defines goad, G-O-A-D, as, quote, a spike, I'm sorry, a spiked stick used for driving cattle. So I just did a quick search, found this one, displayed it here. This is one for an ox goad. Notice the pointed tool in the farmer's hand. What do you think that's used for? What's that? To spank them, yeah. <laughs> so there's the carrot, like you put in front of the horse. You ever see those cartoons? Like little rascals, they dangle the carrot in front to get the, the horse to go in front. Doesn't have much of a memory, because hey, no matter how fast I run, it keeps the same distance in front of me. The carrot, the positive motivation, and then the stick, right? Come on, <laughs> don't be a stubborn ox. Wait a second. This is the word that Jesus used against Saul. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. Saul's not a farmer, and he's not an ox. Well, wait a second. Jesus is giving you great insight. He's peeling back the curtain and letting you and I know the inner workings of the heart and the way that the Spirit of God will convict the heart. Now, who's the one that Saul is really persecuting? He's killing Christians. Remember the previous passage we just read? He, he was involved in killing Stephen, the first Christian martyr for the faith. But who was the one really being persecuted? Was it the people? It was Jesus. Think about that, Christian. When you stand for the Lord and His Word and righteousness, don't take it personal. As tough as that might be, don't take it personal. He's the one that takes it personal. He's the one that gets offended. And he's the one that he will have to go and convict the heart. He'll goad the heart of the person on, like with Saul. But verse 5 is critical for us to know because Jesus reveals for us the inner workings of the heart. And hey, Saul did not know that his pride was blinding him. Saul did not know that his pride was blinding him. So he had a spiritual blindness, and then we'll see as the passage goes on, we'll probably see this next week, how then God will give him a physical blindness. And this is what happens. So it's because at this stage in Paul's life, or Saul, he did not know how God convicts the heart. So we want to study this. So Jesus, if we can grasp this, can we grasp this here, guys? Jesus is giving you and I a case study. His life's on display. 2,000 years ago, roughly, this is what happened. And Jesus is giving you and I a great case study. Because when you're sitting there praying and wondering and pondering, God, how do you speak to my heart? I want to hear from you. Oh, check out Acts chapter 9. This is one of the places. So because he didn't know how to hear God's voice, Saul misinterpreted God's conviction upon his heart. This is huge. These five verses in Acts 9, it's huge. If you can get this down, then you'll do great with God. Saul didn't know, so let's study his life. So he misinterpreted God's conviction upon his heart, and instead of him humbling his heart before God's conviction, this goading of the Holy Spirit, just like a farmer with the goad poking the butt, <laughs> poking the rear, poking the leg of the ox to get it to go forward, that was something the Holy Spirit was doing upon the heart of Saul. And because Saul did not know how to interpret that, he ended up fighting against, guess who? Against Jesus. Does that ever happen to any of you? And then you'll remember Acts 9 verse 5. Perhaps this will be locked away in your long-term memory. That's my hope and prayer. Oh Lord, I'm kicking against the goads. It's hard to kick against the goads, isn't it, Drew? Yes, it is. Because a soft foot kicks back and the farmer's got a nice pointed metal object and the harder your soft foot kicks against that pointy metal object, what happens to your soft foot? The harder it hurts, right? The harder I get, that can't be you, Lord. <laughs> 
ow, but that hurts. And you kick harder and harder. Saul was kicking hard against the conviction of the Holy Spirit upon the heart. And he didn't know how to interpret that. Instead of humbling his heart, which God wanted, he used it to fuel his passion to kill Christians. Folks, this is exactly what happens. I'm going to say this again. This is exactly what happens when the Christian wants to simply walk out God's word in her or his life. Maybe you're sharing a Bible verse or a principle or your life is exemplifying it and then you go through persecution. Does that happen with any of you guys? Does that happen with any of your families? That's typically, right? Typical. What happens? Well, you might go through persecution. You got to allow, like David said, the battle belongs to who? To me and my flesh. No. The battle belongs to the Lord. Just like David said. You got to allow God to fight your battles because he brings much greater conviction. He's a better preacher to the heart. And boy, when you're sleeping and then someone that wants to be maybe the hater in your life because all you're doing is obeying God, he can torment them while they sleep. Not that you want them to torment, but to quote Jesus, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. Some people will kick so hard that emotionally they get to be a wreck. Mentally, with their thought life, they get wrecked. And then spiritually, their walk already stopped. But they're running not even on fumes. They're totally in the flesh. And the flesh profits nothing. And the flesh and the Spirit of God are at enmity. They're at war. That's the internal battle. So Jesus is giving you and I a great look into the internal workings of how God convicts the heart. Again, Acts 9 verse 5 Spoken to Saul, but maybe this is for somebody here. Are you kicking against the goads? Maybe Jesus will say to somebody here today, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. <sighs> Even for myself, got a quick illustration, quick story. Just days ago, I'm talking Tuesday. Just days ago, Tuesday. Had a brother and friend contact me. I won't go into great detail. <sighs> because I want to honor the person, but it is such a glorious victory that God gave to, for both of us, especially for myself and my bride, Susan. But just days ago, a brother contacted me who we lost touch for about 10 years, roughly, something like that. So he was a friend and a brother, but Susan and, I, and myself had to confront this person on some things, at him and his wife. And it ended up kind of ugly. We didn't want it to be that way. We wanted to help you know, reconcile and so forth. But you just you know how that is. Sometimes you're, you're sharing with someone and God really is breaking your heart. You want to love them and help them. And you're called to, to be a preacher of word of truth. And then it breaks friendships at times. Well, then 10 years ago, the person, you know, they, they, they just broke off all communication, both he and his wife. And it's like, oh, real grueling to the heart. The battle belongs to the Lord, though, right? And so God, what do we do? And I just, I vaguely remember but I greatly remember the, the feeling, the sense, the emotions I went through. And especially how the Lord was reminding me to just keep moving forward with integrity, both me and my bride, Susan, and others. Because it, it got to be kind of an ugly situation. But yet, we wanted to maintain integrity. God, it's your battle. These are your kids. They say they're saved. They're yours. Help me and help Susan to just move forward, no matter what pain and gossip and so forth. Help us just to count on you. And no matter what we got to go through, help us to trust you. It doesn't happen all the time with me. There are like a few occasions. This was one of the occasions. And then his brother, 10 years later, contacted me. 10 years, right? Roughly 10 years. He was now humble. And I thought, oh, praise the Lord. He wanted to talk. Contacted me Tuesday before the, the women's night thing. And so I, I chimed back. Uh, wanted to do like a quick Zoom call with the person. So we connected. We talked a little bit. He was humble. And... I just knew what was burning in my heart. And I got to tell you, I'll, I'll admit, the, one of the first things that hit my heart was, like, you're your flesh, right? And I'm like, what? I'm so stupid. Can you please help me, God, just to humble my heart? I'm just telling you honestly how it happened in my heart. And then the second thought right away is, oh, Lord, who am I? I got to forgive everybody. And in Ephesians 4, was it 32? I, I have to be tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave me. I'm like, let me, let me just do this, Lord. 
And let me put all the junk of the pain of the past behind. And so I'll talk with this person. He was able to humble himself. He apologized. I prayed for him. I remember praying twice for the person. Uh, unfortunately, what had happened, and I won't get into great detail, but, you know, again, just like what happened with Saul, when someone kicks against the goads, he ended up destroying his life and his wife's life. They split. They're no longer together. And I sat there. I'm not going to rejoice over that. You don't want to rejoice over the flesh. But just like with Saul, you realize, wow. I just that sense of awe came over me because I was studying this passage. And, you know, you get like goosebumps already, spiritual goosebumps. And you think, wow. That's so awesome, God. Not the fact that people's lives got destroyed. I praise God because now they're able to, I think, separately rebuild their lives. And I want to keep praying for them because they're my friends. And they're the eternal brother and sister in Christ. But to see the strength of God's Spirit and God's Word and how He'll protect you if you just trust God. And I'm telling you, 10 years. For Saul of Tarsus, I mean, his, his was a radical testimony. But for my brother and friend... Sadly, I guess, and he admitted it was because of pride. He's like, I'm sorry, I was young, I was stupid. Can you forgive me? I'm like, yeah, of course. I was able to just love him. And then to reconcile a friendship. And to feel that sense of, of God bringing peace. And I thought, wow, that's so awesome. But you know what I was thinking? Acts chapter 9. And I just love when God does this. Again, I won't go into great detail. But I, just to illustrate the story, I think God was speaking to me and also for me to be able to share with you guys a personal story that's right here relevant to me. And in my right, Susan, but for us to be able to share with you, that, wow, look what God does. Again, when God convicts the heart, see, this is another person that I was this, this person too, just like Saul, but my brother and friend, he didn't know he was kicking against God. They just see the person in front of them and they hear the voice that's in front of them, but they're not able to hear from God. They're not able to see God, they see you. And so sometimes a persecution might come. But don't fear. Continue forward in faith with the Lord and to know that God is the one who will win the victory for you. So I just, I praise Jesus that he actually did that for me and my wife. It's sad that others had to have their lives destroyed, but I just had to move forward with God and do exactly what God wanted me to do. And you need to too, as well. So just know, whether it's Saul of Tarsus or anybody that might persecute you as a Christian, you just want to stand for God's word of truth, and you want to simply maybe share His word with someone, and it might hit and hurt the heart. And you might go through persecution. Let's just get real. You're going to go through persecution, because this is sharper than any what? Two-edged sword. Two sword. And a double-edged sword is not meant to slice. I've taken some martial arts. When you look at some of the, like the, the weapons, they're meant to slice a double-edged sword. It, think of like a spear or an arrow. It's meant to pierce. It's designed to kill flesh. Think about that. You're saying that this is sharper than a double-edged sword? Wow. <laughs> it's not meant to slice and cut my flesh. It's meant to kill and crucify my flesh. So as you simply read this to somebody else, they're going to say, ouch, and they might bite back at you. Don't take it personal. Let God fight your battles. So at this point, it's good for us to know that there was three simple but very strong principles that Saul did not know. Later, when he became Paul the Apostle, he did know this. Because we see even later, and we'll get into this in the later chapters of the book of Acts, he knew exactly this principle of how the Holy Spirit will convict. The first principle I want to share with you that Saul didn't know, but you need to know, and we'll learn today, of how God convicts the heart is that, hey, the Holy Spirit is the one that convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So when Saul was killing Christians, he didn't know he was in sin. I mean, think about that. Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments, <laughs> shouldn't murder. But he was so blinded by his pride, he didn't want to give in. This is the Holy Spirit's job. Je Jesus tells us in John 16, verse 8, And when He has come, He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So you can, thinking about, or speaking about the Holy Spirit. The second principle I want to share with you that Saul didn't know, but you know, is God can use pain to get us to do His will. Did you know that? <laughs> if you guys know that. <laughs> this is the thing that as a Christian matures, you will get to know this. Hey, fake Christianity will tell you things like, oh, if it feels good, do it. Yeah. And if it don't feel good, it's not of God. Well, that's actually of Satan. 
Here's what the Bible says in Psalm 32, verse 8 and 9. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. That's what God wants to do. He wants to just guide you with his eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. You ever see when you see a horse rider put that bit and bridle on the horse, and the horse is like biting in the air? <laughs> Some of you have, have ridden horses or have horses, right? Any of you guys ride a horse? Some of you guys have. You have to pull very gently on the reins, right? Which is why they got to tell kids, okay, don't gink. <laughs> You're going to destroy and hurt the horse. And they have this spot between the teeth. You put that bit there, and you, you put the hit, hit in the kind of cage, right, the bridle. That's a picture that God uses with the horse or the mule to show you as if to say, I don't want to use painful measures to get you to go where I want you to go. But he will. <laughs> he will. Any of you guys know that? He will. <laughs> this is why he says, I want to guide you with my eye. I don't want to have to use pain to get you to stop or turn or do or not do what I want you to do. It's important to know this, Christian. Saul of Tarsus did not know this. Oh, boy. As he goes on, he will learn this. So God could use pain to get us to do his will. The third principle I want to share with you today about how God convicts the heart that Saul of Tarsus did not know, but you and I will, is, and this is a principle found in the Old Testament, but it's quoted by James in James 4, 6, and Peter in 1 Peter 5, verse 5. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So Saul, in his pride, his anger turned into rage. And you can see that word empneo in verse 1. His breathing was animated. <sighs> if you ever see someone in rage and sustained, this guy had a mission for killing Christians. You think, that is beyond evil, right? Think about that. The only one happy was Satan, Saul, the high priest, and others. That's where he was. He was so far gone. It was his pride that was blinding him. And so later on, Jesus actually gives him a physical blindness. So the question today, I'm going to keep this short. We're going to pray to close in a bit. And then we're going to actually go ahead and partake of communion. For those that want to partake as a church family. But are you kicking against the goads? Are you? Humble your heart. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. We're going to continue this journey through Acts chapter 9 in this study that I'm going to call How God Convicts the Heart. So please come in again next Sunday. We're going to learn more. This is the, the negative side. We're going to see a little bit on the positive side in a bit, how God convicts the heart. But I want us to learn because we tend to learn best experientially, right? Who here likes to learn hands-on training? Isn't that true? All of us are, right? You don't just read it and think, oh, I got this. I'm squared away. I'm straight. I, I know what to do. No, usually we end up running, and by the fifth time you run full speed you're with your face into a brick wall, that's when you go, I think you're speaking to me, God. <laughs> I've wrecked my life, and now can you rebuild it? Well, this is actually what happens with Saul of Tarsus, and God's like opening up his journal. We call Acts chapter 9. This is his backstory. So now you can have empathy when you're reading his letters. 13 letters he writes in the New Testament. Now when you read his letters, you realize... The one person that's the main teacher to the church to teach you and I about the grace of God and the mercy of God is this guy that was slaying Christians who was so enraged at his, even his breathing, his whole, whole life, his purpose, his mission was really to kill Christians. And he's like, grace and peace to you. <laughs> and you think something's wrong with him. No, this is the awesome transformational work of God. And you and I need to know what happens upon our hearts. So I'm going to close this with a word of prayer, but I want to ask you that if you are kicking against the goads, if God is speaking to you, simply humble your heart. You all want grace. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble your heart. Surrender to the Spirit of God. Turn from your sins. Turn to Jesus. He's the one that loves you. He died for all of us. We're all sinners. He died for us upon the cross, 
rose from the grave, lives forevermore. He wants us to turn away from our sins, to repent, as the Bible says, and turn to Him, the one who gives us new life. Amen? Let's all stand, please. We'll close with a little word of prayer, and then we'll partake of communion. Father in heaven, we thank you for what you show us in your word. And we ask, Father, can you please, can you please help us, Lord, to accept the fact that, wow, we're sinners. All of us have sinned. All of us have been like Saul. Maybe not so bad as killing Christians or going on a 200-mile journey to drag Christians away in chains to Jerusalem for torture and murder. But Lord, we've all broken your law. We've all sinned against you. And even indirectly, as we sin against other people, it's really a sin against you. So we confess that to you. We're all sinners, even as you say. And we admit and accept and receive and believe the fact that Jesus died on the cross for all of our sins and for all of us. We want to repent and turn away from our sins. We want to humble our hearts before you in your holy presence, God, amongst your family, the family of God here. We confess these things to you and we ask for your strength to turn away from our sins and to follow you, God. Help us to learn to discern how you convict our hearts, how you would speak to us. And as we read the story of someone like Saul of Tarsus, we thank you for what you've done in his life. Please do the same transformational work within all of our lives, God. Help us to follow you fully, but empower us that we might do so, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.